you. Good, thank you. How are you going? I'm good. Have you had a good bank holiday weekend? I did. Um, I really did. Before coming to moving to the UK, I moved here in September. Um, I had a fascination with Brighton for some reason. Okay. I really wanted to live in Brighton. I know. <laughs> yeah. Now I've been there, I'm like, maybe not. Um, but went there on Monday <laughs> with some friends. Did the role well, of Never go and see your idols. Uh, you know, just, just think of Brighton as kind of, you know, like something out of The Wizard of Oz, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like you're going to go to one day, but you haven't been yet. I should have I should have just admired it from afar. It is gorgeous. Like, that pier is pretty unique. Um, but, no, it was a great day. Um, how about you? You came down to London. I No, I didn't. No. Oh, sorry. I thought you said oh. Stratford that you'd Stratford. been down. Now, you see, you're showing your non-English um, background here. There's two Stratfords. There's Stratford in London. Okay. And there's Stratford-on-Avon in the Midlands. Oh. And I went to Stratford-on-Avon. Um, and I saw a play by William Shakespeare, and it was all very good and very funny. And, yeah, had a, had a great weekend. But, of course, really looking forward to seeing you and doing this webinar on, on Tuesday. Thank you. No, it's always great to see you. Um, cool. So people have started rocking and rolling in. Um, I will just say a little bit to like the format of our AMAs. Um, David and I, whenever we've managed to meet in person, um, which despite our strong bond of friendship, I think is only two or three times <laughs> that we've seen each other in real life. Um, we often end up having conversations about AML um, and topics and what we heard people talking about. Um, so this is kind of set up to be you're just a fly on the wall uh, with any kind of conversations that David and I have over a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Um, but we would love uh, for you, as we're talking along, um, to submit your AML questions in the chat in the chat box to the right. Um, there's no such thing as a silly question, and David and I have heard them all. Um, so as it comes up, just yeah, feel free to shoot shoot us through a question. We'll try get to get to it and answer it. Um, but yeah, last month was great. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question actually. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I'd like um, to ask the attendees. I, I'm actually speaking at Accountex next week, and yeah. I, think, I believe you're going to Accountex as well. So I'll see you there. Yeah. Um, and I am talking really about the basics, about policies, controls and procedures documents, about firm wide risk assessments, about training records, about things like that. Um, and I just wonder, are people still wanting to hear a, about the basics um, or are they wanting to hear the more sort of abstruse questions about what do you do if you've got a a client in Papua New Guinea or something like that, you know. Um, so if there's any feedback comes through the chat, feel free to to tell me basics or detail, and uh, I'll try and sort of work something in next week to a context. No, that sounds great. Um, I'm sure that the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, on the basics. <laughs> uh, from what I know, I know you've talked to a lot of accountants, Sophie, at um, different exhibitions. And you tell me that they still ask questions about the basics. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, conferences are really great. Talks are really great. But often those talks are centered around the future and what AML could look like in the future or what could technology look like in the future. And that's great. Um, but if I don't have the basics down, then anything regarding the future is going to be quite intimidating and, like, not realistic to achieve if yeah i'm still kind of missing that basic foundations yeah so you don't want to know about aml on the moon or <laughs> or deep fakes <laughs> is it topical right. deep fakes and aml checks oh uh, yeah no that's fascinating but yeah no you can't cook a muffin without flour so you need the basic fundamentals to really make it flourish um okay let's get into the questions i know we set a little discussion topic before but just you and i we always just tend to yarn anyway um <laughs> but yes as i said any questions send them through um and yeah we'll get to answering them but the pre ones that um people submitted when registering for today mm -hmm. And I'm going to read this one in 
every ounce of theatrical flair it was written with. Um, it says, <laughs> I spend hours, days, keeping AML compliant for free. Um, I'm sure that means that the AML compliance at this person's firm, that they have to do it for free, the clients don't pay for it. Um, how does this stop a client doing the odd cash job? So you spend hours doing AML on this person and then they go behind your back and kind of do someone's plumbing or building or sell yeah. some lemons on the side of the street. I'm not sure. How do you so, stop? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the question, how does this stop a client doing a, a cash job on the side? I can answer in two words. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> it, it doesn't. And um, the kind of wider question around that is, what, why are we doing this? You know, what what are we doing it for? Um, and the, the truth, um, as, as you know, Sophie, I don't represent any of the professional bodies or anything. Uh, so I, I can say what I think um, without fear of uh, upsetting some institution that I belong to. Um, so, yeah, what I think is that what we actually have is a situation where everybody is concerned not about money laundering risk, about the risk that clients are money laundering, but about supervisory body and penalty risk, uh, which is the risk that our supervisory body will come around and um, criticize what we do, uh, start disciplinary proceedings, uh, do some penalties and things. And actually, um, I, was, I was looking at some penalties the other day for somebody. Somebody got in touch with me and said, I've got this, um, this penalty letter. What do you think? And the, the penalties were calculated on the basis of, um, it was late registration, and it was on the basis of a, a £5,000 penalty for each three months that the registration was late. Okay. And the registration was years late. Um, so, you know, you, you're well into five figures in terms of penalties. Um, and I just thought, I was shocked. Um, I, as you know, it's not my thing to say to people, oh, penalties, penalties, penalties. You must, um, I'm much more about, hey, we can fix this. You know, we can sort it out. We can minimize the penalties and so on and so on. But I was shocked at the level of penalties. And the supervisory body on, on that occasion was actually HMRC. So I, I know a lot of accountants kind of think, if it all goes wrong, I'll just quit my professional body and I'll sign up with HMRC and it'll be fine. Um, well, HMRC are not soft. They are not, <laughs> they are not your best friends when it comes to AML. Um, they, uh, the penalties that they operate can be serious money. And even um, I, I was helping a guy who was thrown out by his professional body for AML failings. And he thought, oh, right, fine. I'll just toddle across to HMRC, register with them. It's fine. Nobody oh. cares. Um, he toddled across to HMRC and they said, in effect, your professional body threw you out. We don't want you. We're not registering you. Um, and uh, you've got 30 days to close your business. And he was like, ah, you know. Um, so um, don't just assume that HMRC are going to be nice and a soft touch because, because they're not. Mm -hmm. However, um, does it stop clients um, doing things that they shouldn't do? No, it doesn't. Um, but we still have to do it and we have to do it because the regulations are there, because the supervisory bodies are there. Um, and I, I know you are thinking, Sophie, ah, supervisory bodies, that's another topic. But we'll, <laughs> we'll maybe get on to that in a yeah. minute. Um, but yeah, what you need to do is to make sure that you've done your bit to follow the regulations, follow the requirements of your supervisory body so that whatever your client gets up to, um, it's not going to come back on you and smack you in the face. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 When we did our pre-talk, which sometimes like when we look, when David and I review the questions that have come in and kind of like discuss the topics ahead of time, just to make sure we're in alignment. Um, one of the things that we talked about regarding this question is 
the answer is no, you can't stop your clients tiddling off and doing odd things that they don't tell you about. But what is critical is that you're covering your butt, excuse me, but you're covering your butt uh, in ensuring that everything that you've done, you've asked all the right questions, you have all the right documentation so that if they go and do that and it blows back on you, you can go, I've checked their ID this year. I know who they are. I know where they live. I know their business. They didn't disclose this to me, and I can prove that they didn't disclose this to me as well. That's the difference. Whereas if they tittle off, do that, uh, it blows back on you, and you go, oh, I've not talked to them in five years. I've got no details on them. Then it blows back on you, and it's, like, naughty. So, yeah. Can you um, – I might be putting you in a precarious position so you can say – go away. If not, can you disclose the amount that that fine was that you were talking about? It was nicely into five figures. Yeah. <laughs> I I know it, but <laughs> as it is, you can, you can, cause we discussed in private, but yeah, it is, it is hefty fines that you can get. Um, but we're not fair mongering, but yeah, I think it is that importance. HMRC is not your friend. So try um yeah work ahead of time and your accountancy body they would be kinder if you ask them for help they wouldn't turn around and be naughty and give you yeah. a fine well uh, sometimes um, a lot of accountants say to me my, I'm, I'm in the professional body um and they're no help all they want to do is criticize me now different professional bodies different supervisory bodies are, are different but certainly in terms of the size of penalties um, the supervisory bodies seem to have lower financial penalties than HMRC. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, if you're subject to disciplinary proceedings by a professional body and it goes to a hearing and so on, they will give you a penalty and they will also say, our, and our costs for doing this are like £10,000 or whatever, you're paying that as well. So um, there are no good answers. <laughs> and... and <laughs> What, what I would say as well is that for an accountant in practice, um, I mean, the bizarre thing is we do audits. We check up on our clients. We absolutely hate somebody checking up on us, which is so hypocritical, isn't it, really? But, but we do. We hate to be audited by our supervisory body. Um, but um, sorry, my computer's telling me something I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> as happens. Um, but um, the, the real penalty for an accountant is actually the anxiety. Yeah. Uh, the anxiety of getting a letter saying, we've referred you to the professional conduct department or whatever it's called, and then weeks pass and months pass. And one case I'm dealing with, uh, the professional body have put together a bundle of documents for the disciplinary hearing. It's 800 pages. Oh my gosh. And you know lawy lawyers are involved in looking at those documents and things, and it's just a huge um uh, amount of anxiety and worry for the practitioner. And when they finally get to the end and they've got to write the check, you think they're thinking, thank goodness that's over. You know, I don't care about the check. It's not the financial penalty that matters, it's all the anxiety and all the work that's involved. Yeah. In, uh, in, in anticipation of that discipline we're here. Yeah. There's not so, enough life rafts out there for accountants when it comes to AML specifically, right? That this is just an hour webinar that we do once a month. <laughs> you can ask anything. And I suppose that's a life raft, but there's just not enough resources out there. Uh, hence why Firm Check has a full suite of education offers that you can engage with um, that will help you understand yeah, where, where you're at and what you're doing. Um, yeah. 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 No. Did you get a quick plug in for Firm Check there? They do pay my bills. So <laughs> I, do have to, I do have to sell them a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay, we'll move on to our next question. Don't forget, you can ask any questions you like in the chat. None have come through today. Last month, it was it was oh. chopping and chilling, but we have enough and we're yarning away long enough that I think we'll be okay. Um, the next one, I'm just going to read it as it's written. Um, we did discuss this beforehand, David. Um, how best to comply when being instructed by solic solicitors for expert reports? Right. Okay. Um, 
so this this is very easy one for me to answer because this is what I do. Um, this is background, the, yeah. The job that I have is getting instructions from solicitors in criminal cases where people have been accused of fraud or drug trafficking or money laundering or whatever. Um, and there is, if you like, a, a kind of a how much question to mm -hmm. be answered. How much money is involved in this? Uh, and they call for a forensic accountant. And hey, that's me. And I do that. So, um, but um, who is my client? Well, my client actually is the solicitor. And I can do ID on the solicitor very easily because um, solicitors in England are all um, listed by the Law Society on the Law Society's website, website. I can have a quick diddle on the website, find that the firm or the solicitor is listed and done. So I don't go around asking the solicitor for his um, council tax bills or whatever. I, I do it via the Law Society website. But hey, who's my real client? Well, my real client is the solicitor's client. Um, and you might think, well, that's easy because the solicitor will have done AML on him. So I, I don't have to bother. Um, the truth is, no. Um, solicitors, particularly in criminal work, solicitors are not subject to the money laundering regs so they don't they don't have to do cdd on uh, people who are accused of crime uh, but i do because uh, they are <clears throat> in effect the beneficial owner in a sense of the work that i do um the fortunate thing for me is that with the solicitor's instructions there's a whole bundle of stuff um, telling me that John Smith has been arrested on the 14th of May, uh, 2023, and his date of birth is um, 1st of January 2000, and so on and so on. All that stuff has been found by the police and put in documents, which the solicitor then sends to me. So again, I don't have to turn up at the local jail uh, and say, um, I, I need to see a passport for John Smith. I just get these documents from the solicitor. I copy bits, stick them in a place for AML documents, and job's done. So have I answered the question? Yeah, <laughs> hopefully I have. Hopefully I have. How best to comply with when being instructed? Yeah, I believe so. Um, I'm going to pull out one of the questions, the two meaty questions. So I'll just bring them forward because they're going to be quite topical for discussion and um, this one from emily it sounds like there's a wee bit of um back and forth i'll just bring it to our front screen um there's a wee bit of back and forth in the firm um i'll read it verbatim we have a complex structure where there are multiple layers of comp comp companies companies um are we required to verify the identity of the directors within each company my understanding is one, dependent upon the risk of the client. Two, should be requesting the names of the directors, however, not necessarily needing to verify their identity unless there is a risk, which brings up the need to do this. So do I need to do identity checks on every director of every company regardless of risk or determined by risk? Basically, Emily, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> In um, the confusion... Uh, certainly, it's never a bad thing to say dependent upon the risk uh, of the client because we talk about um, risk being a factor in our CDD. So that is definitely the right textbook answer. But let's talk about what you actually do. Um, one of the regulations in the MLR does say that you have to uh, determine and verify, and those are probably not exactly the right words, um, the I the names of every company director of a client company. Um, it, now, I'm assuming here, Emily, that these um, other companies, the multiple layers of companies, are all your clients. They may not be. But if they are all your clients, then you certainly have to verify who are the directors of each client company. Uh, there's maybe an issue about how you do that because you're not really supposed to just do a company's house search and rely on that because we all know it's it's very easy for dodgy people to file stuff at company's house uh, that is not valid. Uh, but um, you're definitely required to verify who they are, verify their names, 
Um, funnily enough, it doesn't say verify their identity. So it's not quite the same as if they were individual plants. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do um, passports and utility bills and electronic checks and so on for all the directors who, who are not your plants as individuals. Um, but you do have to uh, confirm their names. Uh, so I, I think it's exactly as you put it in your question, should be requesting the names of the directors, however, not necessarily needing to verify their identity unless there is a risk which brings up the need to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Emily, if you want a job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Giving AML advice. Yeah, you're right. I agree with you. Question, sorry, I don't mean to make your answer complicated, um, but the person of significant control within this company structure, that person should be like uh, identity verified, like a, yes, the a PS person sanctions check and yes, stuff like that. PS is, these are people who own more than 25% of the equity in the company. Yeah, you have to you have to do work on the PSCs. And you also have to check that the company's house record of PSCs is correct. Okay. Cool. Um, the legislation says that if, if you find it's not correct, you report that to company's house. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, if, it just causes a nightmare. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, if, if they're your client, just go to them and say, hey, you know, we need to file a new uh, confirmation statement with the correct information. And once you file the correct information, then you don't need to report to company's house that the information is not correct, obviously. Got um, it. If they're not your clients, then, then you might have to do a report saying that the PSC is not correct to company's house. Got it. Okay, cool. So the answer is identity verification on the PSCs. But other than that, no. Other than that, name checking. Name checking. Okay. Does Sophie Maxwell, she the director of? boss enterprises or something okay got it okay um okay so the next one i had pre-submitted um was payroll only clients i'd be actually kind of interested if how many people are in here that deal with payroll only clients um payroll only clients uh, we don't have access to the daily transactions nor do we have the right to how do we answer the aml questions to satisfy the inspectors okay Quickie, um, sadly, payroll is regarded as higher risk type of work. And the reason payroll is regarded as higher risk um, is that you could use a payroll to funnel money to dummy employees and yeah. uh, that way uh, launder money. I'm not convinced that happens very much. Um, but hey, uh so payroll is is a bit of a sensitive point with supervisory bodies but then if you're only doing payroll for a client um the client employer uh, company or business that the employer is your client you do need to do your client due diligence on that employer so you need to uh check the identity uh you need to uh check the pscs uh, and so on uh, just as you would with any other client. Um, the question is daily transactions. Now, the payroll risk, money laundering risk, isn't about um, payments to suppliers and such like, the sort of general daily transactions of the client company, of the employer. So um, you don't have access to that and you don't need access to that because that's not where your risk is. Um, essentially, um, and that's the answer. Is, <laughs> pardon? I said, and that's the answer. <laughs> that's the answer. Um, so essentially, what we're saying is, where is the money laundering risk that you're addressing if you're just doing payroll? And the money laundering risk is to do with the payroll, uh, not to do with the other transactions of the client company. Yeah, got it. Yeah, the okay. question being, yeah, how do we answer the AML questions to satisfy the inspectors? So you do the checks. 
yeah. on the company itself. Yeah. And yeah. I was just thinking then as well, I feel like we've got a little bit of a language barrier and that uh, when you say checks, you need to check that the directors and the PCs is correct. In my head, because obviously I'm coming from a software perspective, when we say check and firm check, um, yeah. it means do your PIP and sanctions check and like a biometric check. But what you're saying is you just need to like cite that that information is correct. Is that what you're saying? Um, what, I, what I'm saying is uh, we need to do the CDD on the uh, client company. I'm assuming it's a company on the client business and uh, the beneficial owners, the PSCs of that, just as we would if we were doing their accounts. But we don't need to look into the daily transactions. Yeah. And again, it's like we talked about last month. Um, for people that weren't here, we have this is our second month, um, and we'll include the recording from past month somewhere. Somewhere there's a few firm check team members in the background, so maybe they'll drop the link in the chat for us. Um, that it's, uh, I want to say it this way, but knowing your role as an accountant, like you're not part of MI6, so it's like you don't need to go hunting for. Al Capone yeah or like <laughs> you own a lot of laundry mats so you know I'm a police officer so it's like taking it back and going okay what's actually required of me and it's to just verify an identity and that's it and when it comes to um proliferation of financing for nuclear weapons uh, I get that word right can, yeah. can I just backpedal a bit there yeah uh, when we are acting for a business, <clears throat> let's say a hairdresser's. Yeah. Okay. Um, not that I've used one in a long time. But, <laughs> They're but expensive, David. You don't want to use one. <laughs> um, hairdressers. Um, then we have to be conscious of what are the money laundering risks associated with that business? Is it, for example, a cash intensive business? Well, yeah, maybe it is. So then you ask yourself, right, what cash records do they keep? Is, is there a till or... Do they have a, you know, a balanced cash book, you know, total cash income, total cash expenditure, bankings? Does it all balance? Is the cash ever counted? So you're thinking about what accountancy work do we do that addresses the risk of money laundering through that business? Um, now, depending on what the business is, the reason I said the right hairdressers is because if it was a manufacturing company, an engineering company, then totally different set of risks totally different accountancy records, totally different accountants work to do it. So um, you have to address the money laundering risks by the work that you do. And that will depend on the client and on the client's records. Yes, got it. Perfect. I will answer this question. So, well, I won't answer it. I'll ask it since we were just talking about paying. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you again, Sophie. I'm sorry. Oh, um, okay. Do you see the one from Charles? I, yeah, and that was the one I was bringing up here because it was quite <laughs> topical. So same mind. <laughs> um, so the question, just for recordings, um, I have had a situation where a company has dummy employees going through a payroll. What's kind of happening there? Yeah, um, I don't know how long ago that was um, that Charles had that um, because today, uh, these days, we have um, what's called RTI, re real-time information, going to HMRC. I've had a situation where a company employed uh, more than 50 people um, and actually, uh, unknown to everybody, uh, they had never registered for PAYE with HMRC. So they were doing the payroll calculations, deducting the tax and the NI, and then pocketing it. Um, and HMRC, for years, didn't tumble to the fact that um, they weren't getting any any money from this company for PAYE. Um, it was only actually they had a VAT inspection and the VAT officer, while he was there, uh, just said, oh, and what's your PAYE reference? And just checked it and it wasn't there. And that caused the whole pack of cards to fall down. Uh, but yeah, there, there can be there can be payroll frauds. Um, there, there can be dummy employees. There can be people who haven't registered uh, with HMRC. Uh, but I would think 
it's rare. For okay. this Charles clarified he did say that this was 10 years ago, so oh, it shouldn't be the case anymore. Or sure. if it is, then it's a bit gross. It's a bit, it's a bit <laughs> something, something's gone on, something's gone on there. Right? It shouldn't be happening because um, the details of that employee should be fired through on the RTI system to HMRC. And one would hope that if that person doesn't exist, then yeah, something's something gonna be flagged. Should happen. Okay, I'll go back to our submitted questions. Uh, payroll. Uh, oh, I'm going to get the word wrong again. Oh, it's just my accent. Why? Well, I'm just going to blame it on that. Um, how to deter how to determine if a client is involved in proliferation financing? Well oh, done. Hi. Okay. Uh, I can't say exhibit exhibition ex exhibition e expedition. <laughs> either okay anyway um sorry so this is actually quite a serious question so it should be serious um how did how to determine if a client is involved in proliferation financing or if he or she is a pip right um so just to recap what proliferation financing is it's to do with the sale purchase uh, manufacture transport whatever of various types of um weapons we're talking nuclear weapons we're talking biological weapons chemical weapons radiological weapons now i would have thought that very very few um, clients of uh, the people that we're talking to today will be involved in any way in that sort of uh, thing and i think the, the simple answer is just ask them um, is your business involved in nuclear, chemical, biological, or radiological weapons in any way. Uh, and they'll probably fall off the chair and think you're really stupid. Uh, you know, when you go to your local hairdresser and say, Do, are you involved in manufacturing nuclear weapons? They might look at you a bit funny. But um, yeah, nothing wrong with asking them. Where you might have most chance of being involved in that, I would have thought, might be in haulage. Um, Oh, haulage. Like, if, um, you're, if you're transporting thing. anything and everything, then you, you don't know, do you? No. Uh, what, what you might be carrying. But um, so the answer to the question is ask them. Um, with regard to whether somebody's a PEP, well, yeah, you can ask them. There is, I think, a better solution, which Sophie has. <laughs> It's like the segue was planned. Um, <laughs> within FirmCheck, the AML software solution, um, you, we have PEP and sanctions checks for free um, as part of your subscription. Uh, so uh, I've gone in and done it for clients um, before when we've onboarded them. Uh, I don't do it often. I just do it sometimes. Um, just It's not a firm check. It's just to clarify, it's not a firm check service offering that you get Sophie Maxwell all in your AML details and doing stuff for you. Um, but anyway, it's super simple. You just click that you want to run that PIP and sanctions check on that on that person um, and it comes back as a pass or a fail. Uh, I had a situation actually when I was going in and doing running these PIP checks is uh, there was an individual that was flagged as a PIP uh, eight years ago and then ran the check again this year and then no longer listed so you do need to run them periodically just to either catch that they've been moved to that list or catch that they've been off that list and you don't need to do the um, strenuous like high risk enhanced due diligence checking that you might determine that you need to do outside of that yeah but you can just yeah. run a check I, I was doing a bit of a demonstration, and I so I did a pep check against David Winch. Oh, no. Of course, I'm not. It turns out I'm very high in the South American military, uh, <laughs> some company. Uh, but the serious point is you might get a false positive yes. when you do a pep check. And then, of course, what you have to do is you have to make a note saying, I am satisfied David Winch is not a colonel in the military of uruguay or wherever it was um and and so it's not him uh, yeah. but they do turn up these false positives but certainly um pep electronic checks is 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 the best answer i would say yeah 
No, perfect. Yeah. And that's true. The same example he flagged as five different people um, in this initial pet check. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, to one, uh, we'll bring up this question. Uh, we recently acquired another accountancy firm. Congratulations. Um, can the other firm keep their policy and procedures the same or do they need to adopt the those of the parent company uh, or the parent firm? And since the client clients from the other firm still need to be fully integrated with us, should we mention those clients in our firm-wide risk assessment? Okay. So um, the firm you've acquired, um, if they have... Uh, say, a concern, a suspicious activity to report uh, to the MLRO, who do they report to? Is, is it the acquiring firm's MLRO, or does the subsidiary, if I can call it that, still have its own MLRO and what have you? Um, and, you know, there's two possible answers to this, each of which are equally, equally good. Either the acquired firm keeps its own systems entirely, uh, keeps its own MLRO, uh, its own policies, controls, and procedures, its own firm-wide risk assessment, and, and just as if it's not been acquired. Or the acquiring firm takes it in, and then its systems cover the acquired firm as well. So um, the acquiring firm has its MLRO, um, its firm-wide risk assessment then will cover the, the whole firm, including the acquired firm, um, its policies, controls, and procedures cover everything and everybody. And, of course, training. Let's not forget training. Uh, everybody needs training in AML as well. So, uh, so have I answered the question? The reason I say have I answered the question is, is that the lady I've been married to for more than 40 <laughs> years says to me, David, you never answer the question. Um, <laughs> and so I keep thinking, right, have I answered the question? No, well, I apologize. Sometimes I go to like read the comments or the questions in the chat. So then I'm not quite fully listening. Um, mm -hmm. But I do like oft how you often speak to like real world examples of things that have happened or that you, you know, that you go through with your clients or stories that you know that kind of give a bit of uh, fullness to what you're explaining. Um, but if you want to just confirm to one if that was covered and if I'm pronouncing your name correct as well please um I really want to jump to this question from Emily um so she's talking about the importance of uh AML compliance training in the firm and trying to <laughs> I can imagine just by the tone she reads trying to strong arm its importance as well and and you know, communicating that this actually needs to be done, that this is a priority within um the firm that she now works for. Um, I look after the AML education for firm check. Uh, so this is very close to my heart of getting this across for firms. Um, how would you answer this question, David? Do you have any advice on how to stress the importance of AML education within firms, especially senior members? That's curious. Yeah, the, uh, the, the problem for Emily is uh, um, we're kind of going to have to come back to the um, the thing which I don't like to do, which is the wagging the finger and talking about penalties and things. Yeah. But um, when you have a supervisory visit and everybody is going to have a supervisory visit sooner or later, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'll just mention that I know one of the professional bodies, for example, puts the smallest firms on an eight-year cycle. Yeah, which sounds great to me. You know, you get a visit now, you won't get another one for eight years. Fantastic. A lot can go wrong in eight years, but never mind. <laughs> um, but sooner or later, you will get a visit. And one of the questions that inevitably is going to be asked is, uh, please, can I see your training record? And um, have you done sufficient training for all the staff who might be relevant? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is account staff, but it might also stretch to even receptionists and people like that if they are obtaining information from clients, if they're chatting with clients. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if you haven't done, if you haven't got that training record, you can expect grief from your supervisory body. Um, and nobody wants that, you know. Um, so much better to resolve this by getting the training done and having the record that it has been done 
now rather than waiting until you get slapped about the face by your supervisory body uh, because you haven't you haven't done it yeah yeah and that's that was my initial reaction as well like and um stress the importance to senior members well they talk in money so if you go if we don't do this we'll get fined then they'll get it whereas they're probably thinking like oh you're just what a waste of time like we all know what aml is so it's not likely they do but if you go this is going to cost us money down the line um in in a hefty fine that, that might be a language that they get right also it's going to cost us grief you know yeah uh, if the professional body is on our back we've got grief we've got anxiety we've got uh, we've got to produce stuff we've got to rush around and you know you just uh, life is too short to suffer <laughs> To suffer that sort of grief you know you just don't want it i know aml doesn't bring in any fees for most people yeah uh, doesn't uh, isn't what you want to do you don't want to find your time spend your time um uh, grassing on your clients because they might be not declaring all their income it's absolutely what you don't want to be yeah but um you uh still need to address these things so that you don't get the grief yeah the grief <laughs> we, we, firm, firm check needs to take that and like make some sort of marketing campaign like avoid the grief like <laughs> which is true which is true um i'll plug here firm check offers free aml education courses i'll get nathan or kev or someone to drop drop a link in there it's like an hour it's unverified cpd um you can administer that to the team emily and it's just an hour and that's all that's required um i will I haven't talked to you that, about this yet, David, because I'm still in the planning stage. Um, but we, when FirmCheck came to the UK September last year, um, we launched uh, like our education courses that we currently have in the existing format that we have them. But I've since gone away and cooked away like a mad scientist on this crazy education concept. It's revolutionary to... Um, the AML industry. I'm really setting big words here, but obviously I've made it, so I think it's great. Um, but we're still in the planning stages of that. Um, I'm hoping it will be a comprehensive, um, a comprehensive course offering for every level of AML understanding, from just getting started to. I know my staff leave me alone. There'll be something for everyone. Um, so our team will just put a little survey. Um, if I'm, I would. This is, I'm not an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> my job's event and community manager. So I'm, I'm, my brain is full of what you guys tell me and what you guys don't know and what you need help with. So what I'll ask here is that um, if you're open for me to contact you and kind of show you this really great project and ask you for feedback on it, what you would include, and um, maybe Emily, this is up your alley. Um, just click yes, um, and I'll get in touch with you personally, and I'd love to have that chat. But I'm a yapper, so I love. Yay, two people said yes so far. Great. Um, <laughs> I'm a yapper, so I would just yeah love to talk to you about what you currently do, um, and what you're missing and what you would want that to look like. So anyway, that was my little plug. But well, I will involve you in it, David, I promise. One of the things is that I actually expect the MLRO to know a lot about AML compliance yeah. that um, somebody in, on the account staff doesn't need to know and doesn't want to know. Uh, a person on the account staff, okay, there's all these things that they have to go through that are in the regulations. But what they really need to know is uh, when, how do I spot something bad that i actually have to do something about and and what tests do i have to go through uh, the mlo needs to know actually quite a lot more mm. and most training doesn't give you that depth of knowledge that the mlo needs yeah so okay. that sounds good sophie i shall sign up Oh, yay. Cool. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, because we had the um, AML Summit in February. Uh, time flies by. It was three half days of AML content. David did an hour session, um, which was much loved. But it's off the back of that. People really appreciated hearing the how of how to do things. Like, you know, so we say implement an AML software. It's like, 
what do you even mean, bro? Like, what do you mean by that? How do I actually do that? So um, it's based on that. So that's yeah, that's what, what I would say, I mean, accountants keep saying, I see these adverts on the telly, you know, saying you can do your own accounts, you can do DIY accounts, and, uh, and the software basically does it all for you. You know, you just tap it, uh, tap a few keys and everything's done. Uh, and accountants cringe because they all know that actually really isn't like that. You mm -hmm. actually need to know something about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same is true with AML. Um, I'm not knocking firm check software. Uh, if my screen I certainly off, hope not. <laughs> but the software doesn't do everything. It's not no. simply a case of buy this software and your AML is done for you, where you can forget it exists. No, that's not how it works. You actually need to know what you're doing with the software in the same way as somebody needs to know what they're doing with accounts software to get accounts that are actually uh, sensible. Yeah, yeah. And I would say that about firm check as well, like when we are at uh, conferences or roadshows or in person, people go, oh, so like you just take my AML and you, you just do it for me. And I'm like, oh. Would love to, uh, but no, uh, <laughs> it's only one part of the journey. Uh, so no, so you AI, automation, outsourcing, all of these hype topics with AML, you will still need to do this manual element with it no matter what you do. And no, FirmCheck doesn't do everything for you, um, but it tries to make it easier and helpful. Um, I'm not a salesperson. I so understand. Buy it or don't. <laughs> People come to me at MLRO support and say, can you do our AML? Yeah. Uh, no, I can help you do the AML to a good standard in a way that you'll get a de decent pass from your supervisory body. Yeah. But I cannot do it for you. You have to be engaged and involved and to understand uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not a great uh, analogy, but it's like, can you raise my kids for me? It's like, um, no, I can nanny you and I can help your kids along the way, but I'm, I'm, I can't raise them. They're not my own. I suppose that's a way to describe AML. Like you can have help in the TV or the iPad or the nanny, but um, you still need to do an element of it yourself. That's not a great analogy. I'm going to need to find another one. <laughs> We've only got one more question. So if anybody's been sitting on one a little bit apprehensive of asking it, um, now's your time. Because um, once we answer this question, we're, we've got some yarns to be had at the end. But um, this one's very simple. It just says foreign entities and how to get their details. Yeah. Um, it depends where. Um, sometimes you can do it with electronic checks. Mm hmm um but not everywhere uh, i think if you're dealing with foreign entities it's important to know which countries are currently on the list of um i was going to say bad countries <laughs> but <laughs> higher risk yeah. and, and <laughs> whether you have to need one of those um, yeah. also there is the issue of sanctions mm -hmm. uh if you're dealing with the uh, eastern european people particularly uh, but it depends, is, is, is the short answer. You might have to uh, do a bit of Googling uh, as to, you know, what's the situation regarding companies registered in, let's say, Singapore? Mm -hmm. is, is there a Singapore company's house? Can I do a search of Singapore company's house um, and get some information? Sitting here right now, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, if that's the issue that you have, then then you can you can find out. Of course, you, you can also talk to the client and say, That's you know, how do, I, how do I verify yeah. things? Because it's it's not secret uh, that you're you're doing this, that you have to do uh, CDD. Uh, they uh, may need some explanation from you that you're subject to UK money laundering regulations, which I think are a bit more severe, a bit more rigorous than some of the other uh, countries around the world uh, yeah. but there we are so yeah no harm in you telling the client yeah I've got, I've got to do client due diligence I've got to um, I, I actually yeah, was dealing with somebody in New Zealand believe it or not and they sent me a New Zealand version of a council tax bill okay which is which is great um, 
having said that, of course, I don't know whether what they sent me was a genuine New Zealand council tax bill because I've never seen one before in my life. It could have been one they cobbled together uh, uh, on their on their laptop and mm. it, totally fake. And that also is an issue. You know, how do you know if you're getting fake documents? And the short answer is you don't really. You can't be that sure. But what you do know, because you're an accountant and because you're experienced and because you know your client, is if you've got a fake client, you know, if, if you've got somebody doing weird things, then that's the problem, not the fact that they've shown you a New Zealand council tax bill, which may or may not be genuine. Yeah. Yeah. And lucky you have a Kiwi friend. Yeah. That you could ask. I could ask. <laughs> For anyone wondering from New Zealand, uh, if you thought Australian, that's rude. Um, okay, so well, yeah, when we discuss this as well, like even winding it back a little bit further, if you're often and I'm not an accountant, this is I'm just sharing the camera's gone out of focus. Um, sharing what I've known from learning from you under your tutelage, David, um, mm -hmm. is that rewinding it back even further, if you're often dealing with um if you're often dealing with foreign entities, including that in your firm-wide risk assessment, so saying, oh, wow. yeah, so saying we often deal with clients from Turkey um, and to identify their, to like verify their identity, we do these procedures, we do these elements um, of a biometric check or checking their version of company's house or getting a, what do you call it, when you get someone to verify a document, like a person to... Are you thinking of certification? Yeah, when you get uh, <laughs> when you get a, you go to a place and then the person looks at the document and goes, "This is a authentic oh, this, document." This is a picture of the real Sophie, and she stood next to me. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, that. Um, yeah. yeah, whether or not you do those. So, yeah, no, fantastic. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I, one thing you've mentioned there, and I'll just underline it. Um, your, your firm-wide risk assessment has to be about your firm uh, and about your clients. And understandably, if you are, let's say, a person who's come from France to live in the UK and you speak for fluent French, I can't even get fluent English here, fluent French, um, then it might be the case, might it, that you will have particularly clients who are French-speaking uh, who have also come over from France, who might have particular types of business. They might be interested in food, restaurants or whatever. Um, your firm-wide risk assessment has got to say all those things and show all those things. Uh, and I have seen cases where um, a firm has obviously served a particular community and a particular group of people. I pick up the firm-wide risk assessment, no mention of that at all. And it's absolutely fundamental. It runs through the firm like a stick of Blackpool rock. Um, and there's no mention. Mm. And you just think that is not an adequate firm-wide risk assessment. Yeah, no, no. It's the story of your firm. That's what I've started to call it, is who are you? Where are you from? Who's involved? Um, I'm not sure if anybody else can see it. This is another firm check cell plug, but I promise it's a good software. But um, Nathan, who lives in New Zealand, but he's over in the UK at the moment, uh, who, he's the head of marketing for firm check. So the bright yellow and black colours is, is Nathan. Um, but he said his prop, NZ property rates bill passed address verification when doing a biometric check. So within firm check, there's a biometric check, which is that one where you like take a weird like video of your face and a picture of your passport, picture of your um, council bill, uh, and it verifies if it's authentic or checks it, make sure it's about right. Uh, so biometric checks are built into firm check as well. So you can you can run that client through firm check, David, and it will tell you whether or not that's an authentic council bill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, okay, cool. So. We um we have a couple of firm check resources. Um, I have done a wee bit more selling of firm check today, which I don't like. Uh, but I love firm check. But we do a um masterclass on the software itself. Um, I'll get the team to pop a link if you want to see the software in action. Um, but David and I and firm check will be at Accountex next week. 
I am yeah. mentally preparing. I'm, I'm having green juices. I'm doing yoga in the morning <laughs> just to, for the two days that we'll be there. It's going to be mental, but it'll be great. You, you need to gargle stuff as well, don't you? Because you're going to be talking all day. Oh, day yes. After day. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Water, muesli bars. Um, David, you're doing a talk on day two, is that right? I am, yes. Two o'clock on day two. I'm doing something called I Wish I'd Spoken to You Sooner. Yeah. Um, because people say these things to me. Somebody said to me, if I'd known it was so simple, I'd have started sooner. And, mm -hmm. and you're thinking, yeah, okay, actually, you, you don't have to be a professor of money laundering to yeah. do AML. Um, you I will... don't have to be an accountant. There you go. There <laughs> you go. Um, you should it, do that. The basics are pretty straightforward, really. You know, I'd love to say it's so complicated. You need to spend me, uh, send me a fortune yeah to, it to you but actually pretty straightforward yeah uh, you just need to start doing it uh starting is the hardest part you just get started get it done uh and, and then yeah I know. You are, yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. my dog barking yes i will <laughs> it later but um yes sorry um, about that oh my no no well like last last month i had the amazon delivery guy <laughs> knocking on the door who I almost got fisticuffs with over it. Um, Firm Cheek will be at stand 1630. I have no concept of what that means except that I'm in front of a stage. I've never been to Accountex before. Um, but one of Firm Cheek's chairman, uh, his name is Hamish Edwards. He was a Zero co-founder. Uh, so he'll be around our stand. Um, you can ask him about the heydays of Zero. Um, he loves talking about. It. He's got heaps of stories like that. That guy's got got some yarns. Um, and the firm check team will be in my custom DIY handmade uh, black uh, black denim jackets with a big firm check symbol on the back. That they take about two hours to make each of them, and I'm on my seventh one, so it's it's hard. And will you be giving away firm check socks and firm check t-shirts and things? Yeah, I was going to ask how the family are they rocking around and firm they check are rocking socks around and... in the firm check socks and the firm check t-shirts and things. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We've got um, some kiwi lollies coming over uh, in one of our team's suitcases again. Those we disappeared at digital accountancy show uh socks t-shirts lollies uh pins stickers we've got some i need to get you one david it says i love aml oh right okay. i need I, i've got my um relax i've seen worse <laughs> mug. um but yeah no, that's so good yeah. Um, we also uh, are doing this monthly, uh, this AMA, um, so you can tune in. Um, I believe we decided the first Tuesday of every month was a, was a good go, good routine. Um, I think the team will put the registration link for that um, down below. Um, but there's some cool things that we're cooking on for this AMA, um, which hopefully will be kicked in next month. Um, but other than that... Yeah, if you didn't get your question asked... And then send them through. And um, do you have an email address, Sophie, that you're giving out for questions? I do. Yeah. So to keep in touch as well, um, David Winch at LinkedIn. <laughs> you can find David on LinkedIn. <laughs> I, I'm trying to push them all on to you, Sophie, and you're pushing them all. Yes, I am on LinkedIn. Um, yes. There is two David Winches on LinkedIn. One's a, one's a sales guy and one's a money laundering guy. I'm the money laundering guy. So. Nice. Yeah. Um, money laundering guy, David. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's the firm check LinkedIn as well. So you can kind of see where we are. Because I, I love meeting you guys in person um, and hearing your stories in real life. And um, I work on my own in my house all day. So I get a little bit in a cage with it. Um, but any questions that you want to ask more privately um, or more directly, you can just email me at sophie.maxwell uh, at firmcheck.com. But other than that, we'll see you at Accountex. Uh, if you tell me that you've been to the AMA or the um, uh, the AML Summit, um, I will have more goodies for you. I will chuck everything I own at you and say thank you. Um, so make sure you drop that. Um, but other than that, we'll see you next month. Sounds yep. about right, eh? Yeah. I need a yeah. sign-off, eh? Like some yeah. sort of parting word. Do see, good. See you, at, 
see you at the context. See you next month. See you next month. Nice. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.